Section 15 of The Interpretation of Dreams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Teal Robin. The Interpretation of Dreams by Sigmund Freud. Translated by A. A. Brill. Section 15. The Material and Resources of Dreams. Recent and Indifferent Impressions in the Dream. Having realised, as a result of analysing the dream of Irma's injection, that the dream was the fulfilment of a wish, we were immediately interested to ascertain whether we had thereby discovered a general characteristic of dreams, and for the time being we put aside every other scientific problem which may have suggested itself in the course of the interpretation. Now that we have reached the goal on this one path, we may turn back and select a new point of departure for exploring dream problems. Even though we may for a time lose sight of the theme of wish fulfilment, which had still to be further considered. Now that we are able, by applying our processes of interpretation, to detect a latent dream content, whose significance far surpasses that of the manifest dream content, we are naturally impelled to return to the individual dream problems, in order to see whether the riddles and contradictions which seem to elude us when we had only the manifest content to work upon, may not now be satisfactorily resolved. The opinions of previous writers on the relation of dreams to waking life, and the origin of the material of dreams, have not been given here. We may recall, however, three peculiarities of the memory in dreams, which have often been noted but never explained. 1. That the dream clearly prefers the impressions of the last few days. Robert Strumpel, Hildebrandt, also Weed Hallam. 2. That it makes a selection in accordance with the principles other than those governing our waking memory, in that it recalls not essential and important, but subordinate and disregarded things. 3. That it has at its disposal the earliest impressions of our childhood, and brings to light again details from this period of life which, again, seem trivial to us, and which in waking life were believed to have been long since forgotten. It is evident that Robert's idea, that the dream is intended to rid our memory of the useless impressions which it has received during the day, is no longer tenable, if indifferent memories from our childhood appear in our dreams with some degree of frequency. We should be obliged to conclude that our dreams generally perform their prescribed task very inadequately. These peculiarities in the dream's choice of material have, of course, been observed by previous writers in the manifest dream content. A. Recent and indifferent impressions in the dream. If I now consult my own experience with regard to the origin of the elements appearing in the dream content, I must in the first place express the opinion that in every dream we may find some reference to the experiences of the preceding day. Whatever dream I turn to, whether my own or someone else's, this experience is always confirmed. Knowing this, I may perhaps begin the work of interpretation by looking for the experience of the preceding day which has stimulated the dream. In many cases, this is indeed the quickest way. With the two dreams that I subjected to a close analysis in the last chapter, the dream of Irma's injection and of the uncle with the yellow beard, the reference to the preceding day is so evident that it needs no further elucidation. But in order to show how constantly this reference may be demonstrated, I shall examine a portion of my own dream, Chronicle. I shall relate only so much of the dream as is necessary for the detection of the dream source in question. 1. I pay a call at a house to which I gain admittance only with difficulty, etc., and meanwhile I am keeping a woman waiting for me. Source a conversation during the evening with a female relative to the effect that she would have to wait for a remittance from which she had asked until, etc. 2. I have written a monograph on a species, uncertain, of plant. Source. In the morning I had seen in a bookseller's window a monograph on the genus Cyclamen. 3. I see two women in the street, mother and daughter, the latter being a patient. Source. A female patient who is under treatment had told me in the evening what difficulties her mother puts in the way of her continuing the treatment. 4. At S and R's bookshop I subscribe to a periodical which costs 20 florins annually. Source. 
During the day, my wife had reminded me that I still owe her twenty forins of her weekly allowance. 5. I receive a communication from the Social Democratic Committee, in which I am addressed as a member. Source. I have received simultaneous communications from the Liberal Committee on Elections and from the President of the Humanitarian Society, of which latter I am actually a member. 6. A man on a steep rock rising from the sea, in the manner of Bocklin. The question might be raised whether a dream invariably refers to the events of the preceding day only, or whether the reference may be extended to include impressions from a longer period of time in the immediate past. This question is probably not of the first importance, but I am inclined to decide in favour of the exclusive priority of the day before the dream, the dream day. Whenever I have thought I had found a case where an impression two or three days old was the source of the dream, I was able to convince myself, after careful investigation, that this impression had been remembered the day before, that is, that a demonstrable reproduction on the day before had been interpolated between the day of the event and the time of the dream. And further, I was able to point to the recent occasion which might have given rise to the recollection of the older impression. On the other hand, I was unable to convince myself that a regular interval of biological significance, H. Swoboda gives the first interval of this kind as 18 hours, elapses between the dream-exciting daytime impression and its recurrence in the dream. I believe, therefore, that for every dream a dream stimulus may be found among these experiences on which one has not yet slept. Havelock Ellis, who has likewise given attention to this problem, states that he has not been able to find any such periodicity of reproduction in his dreams, although he has looked for it. He relates the dream in which he found himself in Spain. He wanted to travel to a place called Daraus, Varaus or Zaraus. On awaking, he was unable to recall any such place names, and thought no more of the matter. A few months later, he actually found the name Zaraus. It was that of a railway station between San Sebastian and Bilbao, through which he had passed in the train eight months, 250 days, before the date of the dream. Thus, the impression of the immediate past, with the exception of the day before the night of the dream, stand in the same relation to the dream content as those of periods indefinitely remote. The dream may select its material from any period of life, provided only that a chain of thought leads back from the experiences of the day of the dream to recent impressions of that earlier period. But why this preference for recent impressions? We shall arrive at some conjectures on this point if we subject one of the dreams already mentioned to a more precise analysis. I select the dream of the botanical monograph. I have written a monograph on a certain plant. The book lies before me. I am just turning over a folded colour plate. A dried specimen of the plant, as though from a herbarium, is bound up with every copy. End of section 15 Recording by Teal Robin